So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our fifth uh, IUB BMB training initiative webinar. So this is also the first of 2023. Um, so my name is Elise, and I'm uh, the current chair of the trainee initiative. Uh, and today I'm joined by Nafeli, Patrick, and Mihaela, who are um, members of our FEBS region of our training initiative. And then we have two special guests today, um, Dr. Mark Roberts and Dr. Julius Vesha. So um, before I introduce our, our first speaker, who will be Mark, I just want to mention that um, the Feli will be posting a feedback questionnaire to the chat. So we'd really like it if you guys would fill this out because we always welcome feedback and that helps us make our next webinars better. Um, and also just to mention that the end uh, of this um, webinar, we're going to have um, some sh uh, short Q&A and we'll also be introducing um, our next uh, webinar, which will be um, held in April um, by our um, African representative team. So we'll give like a little brief introduction to that. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to warmly welcome Dr. Mark Roberts. Um, so I had the pleasure of meeting Mark uh, in person last year at the Global Biochemistry Summit and Young Scientist Forum um, in Lisbon, Portugal. And he gave um, what I heard was a very well received kind of practical session on scientific public engagement. And I, I unfortunately, I missed it because I was hosting my own practical session in parallel. So I'm really looking forward to listening in this time. Um, so just very briefly, a little bit about Mark. Um, so he's not only like a superb bacterial biochemist and lecturer at the University of Oxford, um, but the reason why we invited him here today is that he has like a huge passion for developing bioscience education. In particular, he's um, phenomenal at hosting kind of scientific public engagement activities and teaching people how to engage um, with their science with the public, um, including my one of my favorite ones that he always mentions, making a jelly baby uh, explode on television, on line television. So anyway, with that, I'd like to give the floor to Mark uh, and I'll stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours. So welcome, Mark. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. It was actually making a jelly ba baby explode live on the radio. Perhaps it doesn't, isn't quite as exciting as television, but never mind. Um, so, hello, uh, I'm Mark. And I guess, despite that kind of introduction, I guess I want to point out that I'm a, I'm a biochemist and I'm coming at this idea of public engagement from the idea of being a scientist. I'm not an expert in public engagement. Yes, I've done quite a few different things. But my expertise is it more comes from the from the science. I'm also going to caveat a little bit by saying that I'm also UK based, and this talk will reflect the fact that the uh, environment that I am in is UK based. I'm flagging that because you you will have different things intentionally in your local countries that the different cultures and things that might um, push things in different ways. But hopefully you. Some of the ideas that we'll talk about will also be applicable across the, across the board and actually thinking about how to engage with different people and, and what they're interested in reflects that sort of local uh, environment. So I guess the next sort of question really then, probably the most important one is, well, what do I mean by public engagement? Well, the definition that actually I quite like using is one uh, created by a UK body or the UK National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement. They're an organisation that help universities in particular engage with the public and um, provide resources uh, for universities and people who work within them. And they describe it as this sort of myriad of ways in which the activity and benefits of higher education and research can be shared with the public. Importantly, and I think this is, is really important from my mind is the idea that engagement is this by definition a two-way process so it's not just uh, the scientist uh, explaining the science to people but it is um, a two-way process there's interaction there's listening and there's a mutual benefit so, so there's a benefit for the scientist as well in in doing it so it's not just you know this idea of sort of communicating science is really trying to engage people and have this sort of two-way conversation um, about the science. And I admit, depending on the format that you use, that two-way can be a bit more challenging, but we'll explore a bit more of that uh, in a minute. So that's what we think public engagement is. I guess the next question really then is, well, why should we even bother doing it? Why should we, as scientists, bother and, and, and consider doing public engagement? 
And I guess if you, there were lots of sort of different reasons that you, you could actually put within this. And I, I sort of put these within the sort of four clouds, as it were. The first one is always this sort of, you can almost describe as a moral obligation. I'm funded by public money, and I suspect many of you watching um, will also be funded by public money, at least in part, if not in, in time. And actually giving back to the public what their money's been spent on, explaining the science that done and communicating that to the to the wider world is, I think, is an important uh, important role. Alongside that, there's also the the obligation almost to in, to inspire the next generation of scientists. I won't live forever, sadly, and um, and so you know we need to inspire the next generation to come along and can and continue the biochemistry and take things further. It can also, more selfishly, help you develop your own skills, both in terms of sort of communication skills and influencing skills, which can be beneficial for you in, in later employment, either in, in academic circles or uh, in industry or whatever you, 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 do, you do later in life. So there's a skills benefit to it. Potentially, there may be also a commercial benefit. You may end up having uh, discussions with uh, the wider public that may lead to, uh, or help the commercialization of the research that you're doing. So there might be a sort of business side to it. And finally, the sort of just en the enhancing research. By thinking about communicating to the public, you, you potentially think about your own research in a different way. And indeed, members of the public may think about your research in a way that you've not really thought about or explored before. And that may you know, provide new ideas, new ways of thinking about your work that may in itself enhance and improve your own um, research or potentially give you different ideas or different directions that you might consider going in. Building a bit more on the moral obligations, there's, a, there's two very interesting surveys um, and the results from that, which was a survey done in the European Union called the Eurobarometer survey. And this surveys um, people in member states across the European Union and asks a whole range of questions. What I like is sort of looking at the, the, the data from these and seeing you know, what uh, members of the public think about science. But from the 2010 survey, they thought that scientists could not be trusted to tell the truth about controversial scientific and technological issues. Now, to put that a bit in context, that the 2010 was around the time there was a number of things in the media about um, climate change papers uh, and about cloning papers being redacted and, not and scientists not necessarily following uh, appropriate procedures. But even, so it, you can sort of see why that might be the case, but then that was actually repeated in the 2021 survey. And whilst there was more trust in science, it was still, um, there still was a, a reasonable um, proportion of people who do not believe that we could be trusted to tell the truth and actually, you know, engaging with people potentially helps break down those barriers of, of understanding what, what motivates us as scientists. By the same token from the 2021 survey, the majority of people wanted scientists to involve, involve and intervene in the political debate, perhaps coloured by some um, global crisis that has happened in recent years that might make, us, make people want scientists more engaged. But it is, the desire is there for us to, to, to be, to, it, be seen in the public sphere. And whilst the citizens in Europe sort of say that or report that they have high levels of interest in science and technology, they don't feel informed. The majority of people only feel well, only feel in terms of the survey moderately well, well informed. So the, the, the scope there and there's interest there, which is exciting. But alongside that, and actually it comes nicely out of the pandemic, is this sort of difficulty in communicating uncertainty. Scientists often taught as fact in schools or presented as fact in the media, where, as we know, it's often the best guess that we currently have at the moment. One of the things I, I thought was very interesting in the pandemic, when there was all these media things of scientists have changed their mind about this. Well, we haven't changed our minds. New data has come along and, and we've um, revised what where we, where we think based on that new data. And it's actually involving people in the scientific method and getting them to understand how we think is actually almost as important as communicating the actual science itself. 
So I've talked a bit about engagement, but who on earth are this public? So here we have um, some members of the public wandering around in the city of London. But actually, when we think of the public, there's actually a huge range of different sort of subgroups or small communities that make up that public. And they can be really diverse. You know, things from film enthusiasts to politicians, to people who like baking, yoga teachers, school students. There's lots of different subgroups within that public. So actually, it's really difficult to engage with the public as a whole. You need to think a little bit about which group or groups you particularly wish to engage with. Helpfully, in a way, you can actually think about the idea that these different groups can actually be split into either groups of demographies, so by age or gender, for, for example, or people have communities of place, so people who are based in Oxford or people who all went to a conference in Lisbon, for example, or communities of interest, for example, people who are all interested in baking or people who are all interested in films or photography. And by understanding what brings those and thinking about what brings those groups together can actually make you think a bit about why those di those different groups have different motivations to engage. And actually thinking about those motivations can help you engage with those groups. In terms of actually engaging, there's a huge range of different ways that you can do it. I really like um, this diagram. This was originally described as the Wellcome Trust Public Engagement Onion although it's been slightly developed further by uh, University College Dublin. But I, what I like about this is was as we move um, from the outside into the middle, okay, we actually move from more one-way communication through to more this sort of di dialogue and two-way communication. But even with these, these one-way communication, methods around the outside, you can still make it engaging, you can still make it two way. For example, by you know, on a blog, looking, having comments and letting people post and respond to that. Newspaper articles and so on, you know, following debates and things on social media. So there were ways to actually make things sort of more interactive and, and more, in, more engaging with that. But actually the method you may choose to engage with your science is gonna be really dependent on what resources you have available to you and also what fits the science you want to do and what fits the audience you want to do. Okay, you may find that, for example, if you wish to engage a more elderly population, they're less likely um, to be into TikTok, for example. So that wouldn't be an appropriate method to attack that, whereas um, potentially targeting teenagers, that might be a really powerful way of actually engaging them in the science. But OK, so we thought a bit about engagement, we thought a bit about the public and we thought a bit about methods that we might do it. The one thing we've not thought about is probably the most important thing. And that's how we evaluate if it's even worked. And if there's one thing that I hope you take away from what we talked about today is thinking about evaluation and thinking about it first. In reality, we're scientists. OK, we do that as a day to day life in the sense we develop hypotheses, we do our experiment, we measure it and we analyse. A hypothesis is the aim of what we want to do with public engagement. The experiment is the piece of public engagement itself. Within that we will measure something and we'll use that to measure whether we are successful or not and we'll analyse that. And by thinking about you know, what you deem as success, that can help you really frame what you want to do with your particular public engagement exercise. Now, I will be honest, though, it's quite difficult sometimes to um, measure success, measure how good a piece of public engagement is, because when people talk about it, they often talk about measuring impact. So here we have some impact, a crater on the moon. But how do we measure it? I mean, is width the important metric? Well, maybe. Or is it depth that's the important metric? You know, because you could have something that's quite narrow and deep or something that's wide and shallow. What's, what's the important metric? Is it circumference that's the important metric? And OK, I've asked a sort of slightly silly question in a way, but actually what I'm trying to sort of get across with this is it's really stepping back when you're thinking about your public engagement and thinking about well, what does success look like? What, you know, 
what would I what would I want to achieve? You know, is that people having a greater knowledge about something? Is that people having a greater understanding about something? Is that people just get, gaining a, gaining an interest or expressing an opinion on a particular point uh, piece of science? And there are loads of different ways that you can do this evaluation. It always disappoints me in a way if you say to students, oh, how should we evaluate the things? Nine times out of ten, they'll talk about doing a survey or a questionnaire. And yeah, that can work. But actually, when you think about doing a piece of public engagement, for example, you're doing a science fair where you've got people coming and going all the time. Actually doing a survey is you're not going to get good feedback and good knowledge about how you about how they've engaged with you. So actually think about sort of different ways of doing it. One really nice way with uh, sort of science fair or something was, was perhaps to have a set of jars with a question and then they put a token into each of the jars. Indeed, I had a colleague and I really loved his, his method of evaluation. He had a pile of Lego bricks and Duplo bricks. So uh, other construction toys are available and gave different colors to different participants and different give, gave Duplo to adults and Lego to kids. And he asked them a question, asked them to put the Duplo in the jar. He deliberately colored, colored it based on gender, although mask that from the participants by not using, uh, well, by using semi-random colours. From counting what was in the, the, the jars at the end of his session, not only did he get an idea of did people understand what was going on, because could they answer this question at the end, but he was also able to break that down by gender, looking at the colour, and by, by age, looking at the size of the brick. And by counting the total number of bricks, he knows how many people he spoke to and engaged with. And that's actually already giving you data about how successful or not your event is. You can put, do a post-it note wall or get people to put post-it notes on, on a graph in different places to say how much they agree or not agree. Or we have a lovely um, thing called scientific scissors here, which is a thing done by the Biochemical Society. We'll talk about it in about three minutes time. And here, actually looking at how people lay things out on, on, the, on the stand actually gives you a, a bit of feedback. Or even just boringly, just measuring the amount of time. I've done uh, a museum exhibition, and one of the ways we measured how successful it was was by following people around with a stopwatch, obviously surreptitiously, and getting some idea of how much they interacted with it. So there are lots of different ways that you can evaluate and get data out so to determine whether, whether your thing has been successful. But it is important to think about it before you do your public engagement activity so you can try and build it in. OK, so takeaways, I guess, from what we've sort of talked about. Firstly, there are sort of many publics. So think about what audience is coming or you're aiming your thing at. What interests them? What brings them together? How can you know what common ground can you engage with them? There are many mediums, there are many ways to communicate your, your science. What's appropriate to your audience, but also what's appropriate to your science as well, because you can use mediums in different ways. The example uh, Elise gave at the start of the, the jelly baby exploding, when the jelly baby exploded loud on the radio, it made this beautiful screaming noise um, because of the way I was actually burning it. And that actually provided a nice talking point to, to, to then explore the rest of the, the science. And it was that because it made that particular noise that we used it for that particular for that radio thing. And how do you make it engaging? What's the sort of two way process? How are you going to get feedback um, and information from your participants? OK, this cannot be sort of direct as part of the thing itself or sort of indirect, for example, via social media, via um, blog posts and so on. So how, might, how are you going to do that? So fine, you're thinking about doing a piece of public engagement, or what advice would I give? The first thing is start small. Don't try and do something big and crazy the first thing you do. Do something small, small and manageable and then build up. Starting small is a great way to try things out and see if they work. Look at training. What, what does your institution do in, in terms of training and support? What does your local learning society either your uh, countrywide one, for example, the Biochemical Society in the UK, or perhaps um, your 
uh, more global ones, for example, like FEBS in Europe or IABMB more, more globally? What training is available that, that potentially could be? What's been done before? We don't live in a vacuum. Indeed, loads of people have done public engagement activities and there's lots out there. Um, many many um, people and learning societies publish these um, on their websites. And so you can use them both for inspiration or just use the activity directly uh, or build on what's, the, what's already there. So don't need to reinvent the wheel. See what's done, been done before. Don't be afraid to experiment and try things out. The only way you'll find out really if it's going to work or is successful is to try things. Think carefully about your audience, your medium and the science. And as you're trying it out, know what success is. That's important because that means you will know whether, whether your experiments are working, you know whether what you're doing in terms of your public engagement is having the impact that you, that you want. Whilst it's important to know what success is, it's also important to, to know that sometimes you'll fail and you'll learn from that. There are things I've done in terms of public engagement where actually I'll come away going, actually, that didn't work very well. I hadn't quite pitched it right to the particular audience. And actually learning from that and, and, and building on that is, is important. Also be realistic. And that also comes back to, to thinking about what is success. Be realistic about what you're going to do. You're unlikely um, to be able to teach or ex uh, engage somebody entirely in a particular topic in huge amounts of depth. So what, what's realistic for, for someone to take away or get out of your piece of public engagement? And think what you're getting out of this, okay? And that comes a bit from this sort of two-way process and think about you know, what, how is this gonna benefit you, what you're going to actually get out of it and make sure that you are getting that out. Okay. So I have two, two more things to do before I, I wrap up. Um, firstly, is to quickly thank all the people whose pictures I have used as part of this presentation. But secondly, I want to use, give, show an example of a public engagement activity and, and, and sort of let you have one that you can sort of explore and sort of see what, what, what is actually, in my mind, a, a good successful activity. This particular activity was developed by the James Brown, uh, who then worked for the UK Biochemical Society and is available on the UK's Biochemical Society's webpage. Um, I've just put the link into the chat if you wish to actually uh, look, look, at, look at this. So it's a science fair activity. It's an activity for um, interacting with people live. It's actually an activity in two parts, which, which I really like. And what's really nice about it is those two parts allow you to engage both with kids and, and with adults. It explores CRISPR-Cas genome editing, and it does by, so by using um, this game called Jenga. It's a tower-based game where normally you try and re remove pieces without the tower falling over. Here, the pieces are all labeled as if they're genes, and participants have to use a, a pair of forceps to try and pull out the a particular gene, those four sets being labelled as, as Cas9. And through that, we can ex explain and explore you know, how Cas9 is, is this targeted um, uh, molecular scissors to actually cut the DNA. Alongside this, sort of at the back is what I would, would, just, what I would describe as an ethical washing line. And there are a number of cards on this ethical washing line that describe different potential applications of CRISPR, Cas9 genome editing. And at one end of the washing line, we're like, yeah, this is really positive. And at the other end, it's, oh, that's not that positive. And we ask members of the public, and this is perhaps more aimed at the adults, to sort of move things around on the washing line about how they feel about you know, the particular applications of genome editing. And again, it, it allows you to engage with them and explore um, their thoughts about genome, edit uh, genome editing, um, and potentially also by regularly sort of photographing that washing line, you get some idea of, of, of uh, some idea of the impact that your thing has actually had. So I apologize that that perhaps was very quick, but hopefully that gives you a sort of nice uh, sort of introduction or some, or some thoughts about public engagement and things you might want to think about when doing so. 
And I'll leave you um, with a picture of the Natural History Museum here in Oxford. Um, and an art installation that was part of the museum exhibition that I was involved in. This is a giant E. coli cell suspended, above, suspended above the mu museum, uh, for jello and, and, and pili and all. Um, but in itself is oh, I, I had a beautiful impact. Thank you very much. I'm going to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Pat. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Roberts, for this very interesting and uh, very useful webinar. And I believe that the participants also find this uh, webinar very interesting based on the questions. So we have a few questions. Uh, keep in mind that we will have the Q&A section at the end. So if we don't answer your question now, it can be answered later, or you can uh, write your question later if you haven't write it, uh, written it yet. So the first question is, uh, you mentioned the difficulty of communicating certain things. Uh, don't you think that we should put a bigger effort in educating people on uh, the scientific process trial and ever ever and how why the, it works like this and why it's uh, beneficial to have a contrasting opinions among scientists so basically how science is uh, done no totally I, I think that's one of the things we, we we do need to try and do within our communi communication and actually you know we and as i say it was really highlighted to me in the pandemic when this idea when scientists had different views and, pe and people were you know, the media sort of pounced on that. And actually, that's normal. We should have different views because we're debating the data and actually, you know, trying to communicate that and, ex and explore the method that science is, is the sort of best guess of where we're at at the moment rather than fact necessarily. Um, it's a difficult thing to do. And actually, you know, it's how you try and, and whether you can build that into actually engaging things in, your, in, a, in a particular area of science as well. I don't know. But it is something I think we do need to try and do more of as, sci as, as scientists, because I think that's sort of lacking in the wider population. Okay, thank you. And uh, maybe one or two more. Uh, so are there any drawbacks in eng engaging the public more in scientific topics? And if they are, which are they? And uh, are there any things we need to be careful when engaging the public? OK, I mean, are there any drawbacks? In my mind, no, I think the public should be engaged in science. I think it's beneficial for them to get an understanding of what we do and for us to, to be able to have an active debate. You cannot you could play an argument that that that, you know, with areas of some more controversial research. And. Um, that that may pose difficulties, but actually, I think in, in many respects, because it's controversial, we should be engaging with the public and we should be um, being open and honest about what we're doing and also sitting, that helps us sit within a good ethical framework and showing that we do sit within an ethical framework and potentially, you know, as sort of taking ideas and, and concerns of the public public ser serious, seriously. Um, because again, it's a, it's a, it's a two, it's a two way process. And actually that is about sort of being open and honest about about our science. So I don't see there being downsides per se, I, but I can see on certain issues, it will be challenging just because of the strong views people have about particular aspects of science. Okay, thank you. And how do you approach the issue of uh, dumping the science? So, um, Basically, uh, like uh, personally, uh, always struggle with finding a way to make the, the science more simple, but also not to make it too simple that the kids feel slighted or to find boring because especially when kids often have different levels of uh, scientific intelligence in similar ages. Yeah, I mean, there's no magic answer to that, sadly, but it is about thinking about your audience and what level they're at and what they or what they already know. And it's nice to you sort of you're sort of saying, well, OK, they, they already know some stuff, but that will vary across the group as well. I mean, and it's just, yeah, some of it is is sitting down and just thinking about different ideas of what could be interesting. I mean, I, I do really like the scientific scissors Jenga game. And actually, once it's been suggested to you, you think, all oh, right, that's really, really visual. That's really clear. 
that actually, you know, had had. So it's it's it. Some of it is perhaps looking for inspiration from other people of what they've done in a similar area of science to you, and actually using that maybe to to guide and give you ideas of of different um, sort of visualizations almost of of the science that you want to do. Because I guess. I don't sort of see it as dumbing down, but more sort of visualising the science or making it accessible. It doesn't necessarily need to be, well, it doesn't necessarily need to be dumbed down per se, but needs to be accessible. And some of that comes from the way that you vi you visualise or, or give people the ability to explore the science. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you very much uh, once again. Dr. Roberts, and uh, we will now continue with our next panelist, so uh, Dr. Julius Vesch. So Patrick, please introduce him, and we will uh, have the longer Q&A at the end. So re a reminder, if uh, someone didn't ask this question, you can still ask uh, Dr. Roberts at the end. Thank you once again. All right, thank you, Michaela. Yeah, we are very happy to have Dr. Yus Veshi here with us today. It's a, it's a great honor. And honestly, there are many things I could say about him, but maybe to give you a, a brief overview and a little bit of background. Uh, Yus started to study sustainable development and energy policy in Germany and the United States. And he also got his PhD in a related field, um, he was studying the German, uh, the German energy transition, especially its dynamics and strategies at the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And now he's the CEO of Psychomex Media Consultancy. So Psychomex will be something you will probably hear about since he's also the author and host of multiple podcasts. And I would already like to hand it over to Julius, who will give you a introduction into um, science communication and its relation to um, social media. Thank you, Patrick, for your very, very nice and kind, uh, yeah, your kind words. I'm going to share straight away my screen. But before I do that, um, I already did some uh, shameless self promotion. And that is I put um, some links into the into the um, into the chat, so to where you find the podcast that Patrick or just mentioned, either on Spotify or on um, on Apple Podcasts, and I also put my my LinkedIn and my my Twitter into that. So if you're interested beyond what uh, uh, what Mark and I do today, um, to to yeah to learn about science communication, social media, um, public engagement, then please feel free. And um, yeah, if you don't, that's fine too. <laughs> so I'm just gonna start um, sharing my screen now. So uh here we go all right this here we go so now i just need to push this button and i hope now nah, this is the wrong one um <laughs> how can i how can i share the other one any one of the team could help me what do Let's you see. what do you mean julius like what do you want to, to share? what do you see do you do you see? Do you see the slide, or do you see? I think you see my my. Um, yeah, my, I do see the my, presenter mode. Yeah, we've yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you yeah. Uh, click display settings at the top, and then swap screens, it will probably it may well work. This display, display settings is. Of, do you see my to, mouse? It's no. to your yeah. left. Yeah, it's like. Up ah, here we go. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, um, so swap, swap presenter. In, here we go. There you go. Magic. That's very helpful. So thanks for that, Mark. So hi, my name is Julius. Um, I have a PhD, as Mark, uh, as Patrick said, from Utrecht University. I'm German, but I live in Norway, in uh, Trondheim, because my wife is Norwegian, and uh, she convinced me to come over uh, two years ago after after my PhD. I work as 100% as a researcher at NTNU, which is the, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim here. It's the largest tech university in Scandinavia. Um, and on the side, I, I run this Psychomax, so the Science Communication Accelerator, which is a um, consultancy, a communication consultancy that focuses specifically on universities and research organizations and has the goal to support and empower researchers in communicating their science. Um, Mark, used the word uh, public engagement. I rather use the word science communication. Um, but when I say that, I also mean what Mark put out, this, this two-way interaction. And I think that social media is a great way. Um, and I am aware that a lot of people can hate, like hate social media, think it's not great and other people love it. And I don't really mind, but I think it's the best opportunity um, to for science communication that we, we ever had. 
I'm going to give you a little bit of an intro to me just very quickly. Then I'm going to tell you a story and then I'm going to give you 10 slides. Um, what I think would equip you for maybe building more content online um, that then can um, communicate and engage people and nourish the curiosity of, uh, of people about the science that you actually do. So Patrick just mentioned that this is the um, the Science Communication Accelerator, because I, when I worked at Fraunhofer ISI in Germany, I worked there for eight years, and Fraunhofer is the largest um, research organization for applied science in Europe. I always have this feeling there's amazing projects, and there's a, a lot of, yeah, reports and papers, and very often they they just, you know, they go into the, in, not in the bin, but into the box next to, or they stay on the hard drives. And even though it's taxpayer money, what was also mentioned here before, they don't, it doesn't really get out. So I thought, thought that, that that's really a shame. That's a pity. And I think that since we are paid by tax by payer money, it would be a great idea to actually make it available more to the, to the, um, to the, uh, to the, to the public, whatever the public really is, um, because it is very, very fragmented. Um, so that's why I started this science communication accelerator podcast two, um, two years ago. Next to that, I also run something that's called the NPower podcast. And we started that actually two years or like one and a half years earlier, right when Corona hit, but we started before. Um, and then it was like, okay, now we had, everything needs to be digital. And this podcast now has over 4,000 streams. Last week, we got over 4,100 streams. And it's really not that we are looking beautiful or we are clever or whatsoever. It's just that we do it. And that's one of the first things that I would like to give to you is like, if you mean this and if you want to be engaging in, in social media and in science communication, then it's like you will learn everything you need. It's just a matter of starting and then persisting. And what we did with this podcast is that it comes out every second week on a Sunday and it has come out for three years and we've got eight, uh, 80 episodes now. And that's why people then eventually find it. And then also um, search engine optimization will sh will sh push it to the people that are actually interested in these topics. So that's one thing I do. And then I do uh, the third podcast. And that's, again, an energy transition podcast because that's what I do. I, I'm an energy transition researcher and it's called the Antinu Energy Transition Podcast. And it comes here from the university. And that's actually the first of these projects where I actually get paid for. Oh, it's part of my my day-to-day -day job. And then next to that, I run this this science communication media agency um, because I I got more calls and call, more calls about, hey, Julius, could you hold a talk? Hey, Julius, could you help us? to build our communication strategy. So I worked with universities like TU Delft. I worked with um, St. Gallen University. I worked with the um, Institute for Nanotechnology and Nanoscience in, in, um, in Barcelona. Uh, and I will work with, for example, with Rotterdam University uh, next month. So that's what I also do on the site. And I can only do this because I don't have children yet. Um, and then I also got a book deal with Cambridge University Press. So, you know, this is like, this is just really to build trust and that you know, that you think that this guy who's actually talking to you right now maybe has something to say that could maybe be beneficial to you. Um, I want to start with this story that I mentioned before, and that is, I would like you to, to think back maybe when you, when, you know, when you were 10, when you were 12 years old, and you would go um, with your family maybe on a Sunday morning, and I don't know if that applies to your culture, but it's a very European thing that you go into bakeries and you uh, maybe on Saturday and Sunday, and then you take the goods that they are, that are made um, there you take them and uh, you go home and um, then you have a nice breakfast on a weekend. And I want you to envision this smell that you have if you go into your local bakery, um, the smell of like baked goods and they're a bit sweet maybe and it's warm in there. Um, it's like a, it's a nice weekend feeling. And now I want you to envision that you go through a neighborhood now, you know, no, you as a PhD researcher, as a postdoc researcher, um, and I want you to think about that. You, it's a Saturday afternoon and you're enjoying yourself and you're with your friends or your family and you go walking through a narrow alley, alley, alleyway and there are some small doors, but you don't really care what's behind it because, you know, you're just walking, passing by. And what if, what if behind one of these doors is actually a bakery, this bakery that you maybe used to go or a very similar one 20 years ago. Um, and that bakery produces really, really nice goods. And they they wake up in the morning. They have they are stressed to get the supply ready. Uh, it's their blood, sweat, and tears, not literally in these products, but <laughs> figuratively in these products. Um, and you you just pass by, and that's okay because you just don't know that behind that small door there's really there's a lot of goods that are really really good, and uh, the quality is really high. And what if what if in that bakery the baker could be a gentleman or a lady decides to put a ventilator next to the oven 
and this ventilator pushes the air that's coming out of the oven onto the road. And you pass by and you suddenly smell, you smell this, you smell this, yeah, these, these, the buns and the bread and everything is fresh. And you like, you get remembered on this, in, on this, on your old experience. And then you might go in there and you take a coffee and, and you know, you, you go in there and you, you, you look for the goods that are actually produced in there. And that I think is a very good picture for, for using social media for us as scientists, because we are having pressure to publish. We're having pressure to get our PhD done. We're having pressure to do admin, to teach, to whatever, whatever it is. We work on weekends, everything. Um, but no one knows that we actually do that because we are not really interested or we're not so good or we're not tra trained or we're not incentivized to actually bring these things out that we're working on. And I think that social media is the opportunity to do that because if no one knows that you work on these things, then how are they supposed to find you? How are they supposed to reach out to you? How are they supposed to use the knowledge that you create in their companies, in their communities, in their municipalities, wherever? But the key to getting your buns, <laughs> your goods out there is to realize that it's all about attention. If you want to sell sneakers, you need the attention of the people that want to buy sneakers. You know, Mark was referring to the people who want to bake something, you know, or it's the same thing. It's like every little group in our society has their specific, yeah, their specific way of what they want, their specific way of how they consume content, everything. So the same thing. If you want to change a law, you have to get the attention of people who can do that. If you want to be a well book speaker, you need to be in front of the people that could book you as a well booked speaker. Uh, speaker. And the same goes for science communication or public engagement. If no one knows that you're a good public engagement person, how are they going to book you? How are they going to invite you? All of that. So when it is all about attention, the question is, where's the attention? And you all, all of you, and I'm pretty sure most of you have a smartphone and you're, you probably charge, many of you charge it probably in the room where you're actually sleeping, even though you, you were supposed to sleep, huh? Like you don't have no need to sleep it to re, to to um, to have it in your uh, in your in your room in your bedroom. So the attention is on this smartphone. So the, the so whatever you do is like I'm happy for everyone who goes into schools and does anything there, or who goes into you know whatever other groups or NGOs or whatever, or you know science museums, whatever. But I think the greatest opportunity for public engagement, the greatest opportunity for science communication is currently digital and it is not taken care of enough. And it's this, this opportunity is not being used by enough people. And it's not just for getting your word out. It's actually also for building brand for yourself, because if you want to be a professor, you got to have the good, uh, you have to, got a good, the good postdoc positions, or at least, you know, if people, potential employers know that you exist, then they might actually reach out to you and ask you, hey, are you interested to in maybe joining our lab? So it's not just a moral obligation. I think it's also just a big opportunity. So the question is, if you want to do something like that, the question is, where do you start? And that can be a bit overwhelming. Like we had newspapers in the 1920s and 30s and eventually with radios and TV and email and SMS and web pages and LinkedIn. And now we've got Discord, Clubhouse, TikTok, Snapchat, Twitch, Instagram, Spotify, uh, Twitter Spaces, Facebook, Skype, and so on that can be overwhelming. But the question is not um, to be overwhelmed by that, but kind of realizing that actually distribution is for free. And as Mark also said, every group is different and every group uses and consumes social media differently. So when you think about creating about social media, the first thing is to think about whom do you actually want to reach and then how can you reach them? And Whatever you do online, there's only four formats how you can create content because you have to create content in order to reach them and convey your message or your word or whatever it is that you want to convey. And these four are text, so that's writing. Then write a blog or go on, on LinkedIn and write something there. You can make audio, that means a podcast. You can do graphics or photos, or you can make videos. These are the ones that are possible. And my question or my, my ask for you would not be to think about, okay, my target group likes that. Yeah, that's a good thought. My target group is into reading. My target group is into video. But turn around and say, what am I good at? Because you all have a full position. You, most of you will work overtime already. So please don't do anything that you don't feel comfortable with. If you like to write and if it flows out of your hands at 10 o'clock at night, please write. If that's not the case, then maybe make a podcast or something. Just do something that you really enjoy doing. Because if people realize that you don't really enjoy it, then why do it, doing it and why consuming it? People will realize if you're enjoying it yourself or if you're not. 
And the great thing is that actually with ChatGPT3 and with AI, there's a lot of opportunities coming around the corner just right now. And I'm not saying that I know all implications for, for AI, and I'm sure there's negative ones as well, partly. But with ChatGPT3, um, that's you can use that in order to create content so much easier, so much bigger than before. It, ca- it helps you to just get ideas for how to create content. It helps you writing your blog posts if you want, or your posts on LinkedIn or on Twitter. It can help you to uh, yeah, create Twitter threads, threads, or it helps you to write the show notes for your podcast episodes, or it actually could even pre-write press releases if that's what you're interested in. And it could also help you writing scripts for YouTube's, uh, YouTube videos. So whatever you think about the format type, you could, or like it's it's such an opportunity right now. And so far in the science ecosphere, it's not really, really happening. So I would highly uh, so, um, um, suggest that you would actually, uh, yeah, you can, that you use AI to get your, uh, your word out um, and it's never been easier. So what do you have to do when you want to start communicating your science online? And it's pretty much, it's four questions. And that's the easiest communication strategy that you can have. So the first one is the question is like, what do you want to achieve by communicating? Yeah. So what what's the topic and what do you want other people to do with the content that you're actually creating? Second question is, whom do you want to reach? And then the question is, okay, if it's young people, maybe TikTok. If it's business people and you want that your stuff is known so that startups can be built or that companies can use it or, you know, whatever it is, then maybe LinkedIn is a good idea. Twitter is by very much... The, 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 the science um, platform, but Twitter is actually having a bit of a discovery problem, meaning it's really hard to build up a Twitter account right now. It's way harder than 10 years ago and 12 years ago. That's very normal with networks. So it, if you have a, a, a young network and it's growing, it's way easier to build up a, a following than with a network that's already ex- been around for 15 years, for example. Then the third question, the third question is what platforms and formats does your uh, does your does your target group consume? So use them. And then the question is, how can you link that up maybe with the content, with your content format strengths? So if you're into writing and everyone that you want to reach is on, on, on TikTok, that's maybe not a bad, ma- not a good match. But if you're good into writing and you want to reach out to business people, then maybe writing eight sentences, 10 sentences, 12 sentences that are well-written and, uh, and you put them on LinkedIn, maybe that's a good idea. So if you answer these four questions, that already gives you a pretty good idea on where to start. And I totally support Mark's idea of like, don't go all crazy, don't be overwhelmed, just start small and then you learn and you'll get better. And the thing is, whatever you do, you will get better over time. You have to maybe actually create 23 bad podcast episodes so that the 24th is really good. Okay, it just takes time and that's how it is. But whatever you do, and this is probably the one thing that I would like you (laughs) to take away, um, is that whatever you do online, if you want to build brand, if you want to communicate your science, if you, whatever you want to do online, there's one key that unlocks it all. And that is that you have to provide value to your target group. If you, pro- if you create something that is not well created or if it, it doesn't help your target group to overcome the challenges or to nourish their curiosity or whatever it is, there's many ways of how you can create value. Um, but if it does not create value for your target group, then then I don't want to say it's a lost cause, but then it's getting really hard to actually reach the people that you want to reach. And when you think about pre- providing value, there's actually two ways how you can do it. You can entertain, and that then it nourishes the es- escapism of people, or you can be educational. So since we as researchers are maybe not the best ones to tell jokes or to make funny videos, could be, but hmm. Maybe it is really good to educate your following and do that piece by piece by piece without dumbing it down. People are not stupid. Um, Give them the opportunity to learn something. Give them the opportunity to take value out of your content. That's the recipe to success. That's the recipe for for building whatever you want to build. Though, social media is a great opportunity but it is not perfect. The online world is not very different from the offline world. That there are people are being harassed, people are being nasty. And if you go on Twitter and you go on the right side on top and you hit on trends, you will see a lot of nasty things. 
So I'm not saying do it all and go for it. And I'm kind of saying that, but it's okay if you don't feel that this is the right place for you. I'm not saying you all have to do it. I'm just saying it's a great opportunity. But I understand and I'm empathetic to people who don't want to focus their work time on social media and science communication or people who just had negative experiences online. So I'm just saying there's a great opportunity and I would love for you to use it, but I can totally understand it if that's not for you and if you feel that this is not right. But if you, for example, think that this could provide value to the others that you, what you do and maybe to yourself and you just need a little bit of a push or if you need a little bit like an, a support system, then I would highly recommend maybe starting a little group in your institute or in your department and just exchange I exchange experiences, how it works. And so if you then get get yeah, a little bit of a, of, a, uh, of a shit storm, then just talk to your fellows and be, be like learn that it's okay like that because there will be random people commenting on your stuff and that's the thing with exposure. People will comment randomly and there will be many others who actually say good things. And it's really, it's really about how you interact online and that's how people often will also treat you back. And in the last resort, it's always super okay to ban people and to block people. Like, don't feel bad to ban and block people because it's your fire that they are coming to. And so your rules will and should apply. So a lot of people, from the experience that I have, don't even get started. So the most important thing, if you think about this, is not to think about, oh, how good it needs to be or to have your expectations high up. It's just start making. <clears throat> Making is the only thing that counts because this is where the most people stop. Our podcast is not the bad post, best po podcast in the world or my science communication podcast is not the best podcast, podcast in the world. I'm having uh, 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 disabilities here to talk. Um, but it's the only thing that the only thing that expect, is there. There's other people that have, who have better voices, who are better structured, who look better, who I don't know. But they don't do it. And that's the thing with your topics as well. If you want to start a top uh, a podcast, the IU BMB po podcast or whatever, or for your institute or for your topic or whatever, if you do that, it's going to be the only one in that specific field. And maybe people in that specific field are underserved. So please, please do that. And don't be ashamed uh, of making mistakes because everything else apart from making and your mindset is commoditized. How do I start a podcast? put it into, uh, into into Google or you put it into ChatGPT 3 click and you get everything you need. How do I make a banger Instagram video? How do I make a banger YouTube video? How do I make a great vlog? You get it all. Everything else is commoditized. The only thing is that you sit down for an hour or whatever and get started. The only thing is, please be realistic with your resources. Because if you have a marketing plan that is like this, and you uh, like a plan how to, what you want to do. And then your time that you can use is like this. Then you can't expect an out, out post, uh, um, a result like this. Yeah. So it's okay to, to not build the largest podcast or the largest YouTube video uh, account. But starting is already a really good. Uh, yeah, is really good already. And then you learn and you'll get better. And over time, you maybe realize, oh, this is what I actually want to do. And maybe you change into science communication or public engagement. And if that's not the case, that's okay too. So that's it. My time is over. Now it's on you. Um, I hope that I provided you a little bit of value with this presentation. And uh, if you have any questions or if you want to reach out, or then please check out the, the, um, the links that I provided before. And if you post something about your science and you add me, my name or my handle, in whatever you do there in your post, I'm always going to be liking it. I'm always going to be commenting it. And if it applies to what I do as well, I'm definitely also going to retweet it. So thanks for having me today. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, IUM uh, BMB team. Um, it was a pleasure being here. And I'm ready to ask some questions, answer some questions if, that's, uh, if, that, if there are some around. So thanks for today. Amazing, Julius. I mean, we have to thank you for this very, and I hope I speak for everyone, inspirational talk. Um, nah. So let's jump... <laughs> Let's jump right in. Like the, the first maybe um, important word to address, I would say, is fear. Like at first, what you said, I think it's very important, like just do the first step, right? There might be the most difficult one, but however, you have to do it to get started at the end. Um, so a question there was, for example, asked, 
how do you overcome the fear of potentially providing wrong or incorrect information when doing public engagement or science communication? Is there, I bet this was also something running through your mind, especially when you started, I guess. So how would you advise people to deal with that? Yeah, it's like, for example, with NPower, this uh, podcast on the German energy transition, we look at so many topics and I'm definitely not an expert in all of these. The good thing that you can do is you can prepare and then you just got to make sure that one that you are well prepared for that very specific topic. And if you're not super sure, like be open about it with yourself and maybe ask a colleague. Everyone wants to help. If you say this is for, for my engagement or whatever it is, people are always helping it. People, we, we as human species, we feel good when we can help other people. And if it's not like, hey, can you read my 300, can you read this 300 um, page report and tell me what's important? That will be too much. But I don't think there's anything to worry. And all of you are experts. I know that some, we always compare ourselves with the people who are like more experienced or more higher up. But if you do an, you do a, a PhD or a postdoc or whatever in biochemistry or, or in molecular biology, how many people on the world can actually know that this little thing might be not super correct? So um, you are all expert. I'm experts. I'm sure you'll do fine and you, you create content that is great. No, I love it. And... Maybe one thing to add, and I think you will probably agree there, it's also about how you phrase things, right? You don't need to say like, this is fact, this is like this, this will lead to that. You can phrase a little bit differently to say like, hey, people, you know, it might be like this or some facts point toward this direction whatsoever. Data suggests be. that. Um, and that's also what Mark said is like, it's not that researchers change their mind. It's just that we get more data. And based on these, based on the new data we have, we get new conclusions. and talking like that a bit like you know it's not that we know how the world functions but we've got data on that that how it could work work if you if you use wording that is a bit you know a bit step back i think there's nothing to worry and um everything's gonna be all right and it, in fact if you do something wrong maybe you you get people who comment on it and then you realize oh this is what i did wrong oh i, pr I appreciate that and comment and say oh you're right and then you do an uh, like a you know a new post on that and say oh just learned Thank you for the community to tell me. Um, here's the new po post or whatever. Um, like that, you know, it's it's not just also Mark said that, and I like that. Is it's not just sending out information. It's it's a process of giving and taking. And also when we active on uh, on LinkedIn, it's an ideation thing. So maybe you actually work with or uh, you find other people who work on the same area. Maybe you you ideate new ideas on on, on for papers, or for books, for YouTube videos, whatever it is. So um, it's very much this this uh, give and take. Oh, I love it. Another question, and maybe if you're fast enough, you can pull up this slide. You had this amazing site with all the different channels and platforms you can use. And somebody was especially interested in how useful do you think is Twitch for science communication? <laughs> um, so let me just, uh, is it this one? No, I think it's this one. Let's see. Uh, no, I don't know what you see now. What do you see, Patrick? Uh, no, it's on you. Like we see the very, yeah, now we see your desktop. No. Yeah, um, maybe I'll just stop this. Doesn't matter, you, doesn't you, matter. You were just referring to, to, to Twitch. Um, I don't think there's a lot of researchers out there on Twitch. I think Twitch is a growing platform. And so there will eventually be some. And for example, two episodes ago on the path, on my podcast, on the Science Communication Accelerator podcast, I had... Um, the gentleman who was the first scientific creator on on TikTok, and he was very ahead of the curve. And with that TikTok account, I think they reached now 9.8 million people. And that's the thing with Twitch. If you're the first one on Twitch, and if you're the first one who understands Twitch as a science communicator, it's work, and you have to chase the berries, and you hope that the berries are not poisoned. But if they're not poisoned, then you are so ahead of the others that you build a, a visible, like a lot of, you can build a lot of visibility there. I'm not saying we are all good at it. I'm not sure if I would be a good Twitcher, but maybe one of you has has the ability or learns about it. And and that's if that's your your target group that hangs out at Twitch, then please go for it. Understanding the platform, I think it's a very crucial point, and maybe we can yeah. connect this right to the um, to the next question, which was like. Um, how can you 
start or how can you overall build an audience for your consultancy? Let's say you're a consultant, right? <laughs> like, um, what is the best structure to, to provide so, uh, what you do to people? So, so this, so this is not a science communication question, but a marketing question. Yeah. Um, but the answer funny enough is the same create content that provides value to your target group. Um, and do that in a way that they realize that you are maybe a person that could help them. And the more content you create and the more value you provide, you get more visibility because when people like it, they share it, they, they like it, they comment, and then the algorithms know that there's value in that post. It could be a video, it could be a text, whatever. And then it's being shown to others. So you get more visibility. And if you come over as a decent person and you also know stuff about it, then, um, then, then you will get more attention of the people that might even be the ones that book you. And in the, in the beginning, it's, it starts very slow and you it might be a good idea to work for free because then the ones that actually for for whom you work they can you know word by mouth uh, talk about you that you did a good job and then eventually it will it will be more successful but do work for free and be really good at what you do or like show that you're good at it and if you're not like but like be very passionate about it or and it's not it's not a or it's like and and create value online and the more you are online the more you have the, the opportunity to get visibility and you know the best idea is why not why not do a podcast about the specific thing that you want to work about or that you want to consult about and invite the people that um that might might have vis more visibility than you um that's that's also what i do with my podcast it's like you know it's like i ask these people to then share it and like that i i get this lovely um in uh, invitation here to talk to you and then maybe someone else and it's it goes on like that if you mean it if you do it only strategically, it's not going to work. But if, if this topic that you want to work with, if that comes from your heart, people will feel it and then people will book you eventually. All right. Uh, maybe one last question. And then since it's past six, I will pass it on to Mikila to open yeah. up the Q&A for some people um, and for you to, dis to discuss. The last question was like, at first, like, is there any copyright on ChatGPT? And I think there's a second question and I hope I don't answer it for you, but... The question is, how can you convert your textbook content into a podcast? If you can give any tip to me, um, please provide <laughs> me some tip. Um, I think it could be related, but the stage is all yours for, for these two. No, Patrick, so uh, I've not heard that there is a copyright on ChatGPT3. So I don't think it is there. But if one is not sure, then please go ahead, check that. You could ask ChatGPT3 if there's copyright on ChatGPT3, and ChatGPT3 will probably answer it. Um, and obviously, ChatGPT3 is an amazing resource in order to make uh, podcast content, but maybe not in the way how you would think straight away. It's like, obviously, you could ask ChatGPT3 or prompt it to create a podcast episode about this topic that I just have to read. But some of us might be good at reading out what ChatGPT3 does if it's not, even though it's not coming from us. But I think that the opportunity of podcast is actually real emotion. And I think real emotion actually comes from real conversations with people. Um, but maybe that's a very specific thing. But I think that if you get people on your podcast and have a real conversation about something, then people will also get more out of this podcast because we are social animals and we are interested in emotions. And if there's just another voice that just reads what Jeopardy 3 wrote, I'm not sure that's too authentic. So um, I think it could be done, but I'm not sure it's the smartest thing to do. I think no. though... Chapter three can give you a lot of ideas and can you help structure and can you ideas for questions, for example, but I think real emotion still sells the best. I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm not aware of a copyright either, but there are already artificial intelligent tools, which can tell you how likely it is that JetGPT generated the text you're using. So this you can already do. But then eventually ChatGPT 3 will be trained to, uh, make text that then is not tracked by these other and then like that you actually in the end you just pit one ai against another ai and they will learn from each other and be trained on each other so i'm not sure like in the long run like how crazy good does that ai need to be that can tell that jet gpt3 wrote that um i think in the in the long run they will be fighting yeah i mean jet gpt4 is seemingly coming so let's say it is coming yeah yeah, is yeah. Coming. <laughs> um yeah so do you thank you so very much i mean uh, i would now pass it on to Michaela. so to open the discussion between maybe the the two of you so between dr mark roberts and dr julius wesher and 
then we can see if we answer some more questions and how everything is going. Thanks, Patrick, for having us. Um, and I think I speak also for Mark for just thanking uh, for for having us today on this on this webinar. It's it's a pleasure and um, we, yeah, thanks for finding us and ma making this possible and happening. I know this is all next to your normal jobs, so highly appreciate it. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, we are on to our last session of today, and we imagine it like a longer Q and A, so you can like write questions or comments or something that uh, one or both of our panelists uh, would you like to dis they like to discuss. So uh, keep in mind this webinar is about communication, so I encourage you to be as engaged as much as possible. Um, so we'll start uh, with uh, maybe more personal question. Uh, which is uh, especially uh, useful for those who are starting in uh, public engagement and have some worries uh, how to like uh, put it in their everyday schedule. So uh, do you consider public engagement activities a part of your job or a leisure time activity and how supportive your employees are on spending time on public engagements and how much time do you think you spend on the engagement activities? So, uh, Dr. Roberts or Dr. Resch, who would like to start? I mean, yeah. I mean, do I say it's a part of my job? Yes, I, I think I think it is really. Um, it it varies how much it, how much time it takes up because it depends on what, what different activities I'm, I'm I'm doing or involved in at, at a particular time. But I do see it as being sort of part of part and parcel of being a scientist. I'm lucky the employers that I've had have, have been very supportive of that and, and that they see the value in uh, people doing doing public engagement. Um, so I guess I, I come I come from that from that perspective, which perhaps is a position of privilege in a way. But it, certainly I see it as, a, as, a, as something that's part of my job. I don't know if Julius wants to comment. I think Michaela, you directly pointed to one of the big flaws of the academic system that is that you know mark and i and many other communicators are not we're not incentivized to do that and it doesn't really play a big role for people to become professors or like get up in the academic ladder um however i think that's about to change but i'm not sure how fast and how drastically that will change so i think in the long run it will matter if you have had like if you wear on podcasts if you if you have a big following on, on social but i don't think it's going to be changing very quickly um okay thank you uh so uh, like you said on your lecture uh you see you see the podcast uh if you don't like doing it then don't do it so we can say it's like your job and also your enjoyment so because yeah your time leisure as well um and uh when you start doing podcast, uh, one of the students participants asked, "How often do you have to be engaged? How often do you have to post uh, things online so your public uh, don't forget about you, so they interact with you?" Is it like a daily, uh, weekly thing? Do as much as you can, but don't get overwhelmed. I would say. Uh, so every time you go out and you post something, that gives people the opportunity to find you. But if in the end you feel stressed. Or if in the end you then like don't do for your real job what you're doing, what you should be doing, and I think that becomes a bit dangerous. Um, the more you do, the better it is, but it, it's easy to to get overwhelmed. So um, that will be my take. And, and when you think about podcasts, it's good to have a rhythm in it. It doesn't need to be every week, but every second week or always the first day of the month or whatever, because then people can expect like then they expect it and then they go directly in and they directly listen to it and i guess you, you people will also have that you in your behavior you know oh today is tuesday i should listen to that podcast um so be reliable as a content creator i think that that is that is very key mark what do you say on that i totally agree about the idea of having having a rhythm to it and, and being uh, sort of open up for what that rhythm is going to, going to be so that people ha have that expectation and sort of come back to it but then also it's also thinking about how you want to do your pod if you were doing a podcast, how you do it and whether you, you get guest people involved and whether and, and so which which may reduce your own workload, as it were. So it doesn't necessarily just have to be you. 
if, if you've got a, a group of colleagues or, or or friends even in different institutions sort of bringing something together I mean, podcast is a really fun format actually in terms of there are so many different styles out there from I think there's one, one called two minute science which yeah exactly um but then there are other there are other ones that are more sort of longer but there are also ones where the more sort of dis you know you have a nice discourse so it doesn't just have to be a, a single voice in a podcast which can be quite fun and what's really cool is if you do like an interview podcast that you actually get to talk to people you would never be able to talk to it's like if, when you say hey can we talk 30 minutes everyone's gonna say hey who are you no but if you say hey i've got a podcast and it is listened 500 times or 200 times whatever it is people are way more likely to to be there and like that you actually get to talk to people that you would otherwise i don't know would never been never had the opportunity i just recently talked to the president of technical university of delft on my podcast and i was like okay otherwise that guy that gentleman would have never taken the time so it it can be also an opportunity for yourself yeah that's a great point on using podcasts as, as like promoting your science and the topics you're interested in and my uh my next question is directed uh on that uh so uh a biotech by technically by tech not by technologist sorry student and uh, asked uh, so he's trying to make changes in agriculture and biotech sector by developing genetically modified crops but uh, he cannot make a way to evaluate uh, his research so uh, which are some tips like how can he reach more public on his science or yeah I mean like... sort of to some extent you need to decide what what your aim is what what your success is going to be mm -hmm. you know is your success that you you want to uh, uh, have a certain number of farmers know and understand what you're doing is your success people in biotech knowing about what you're doing is your success a wider, wider public and, and and you define define your aim first and then think about how you might evaluate it and measure that i did so there was another question that someone posed about sort of evaluation methods and i put three websites actually in the main chat um one from university of oxford one from the national center for coordinating public engagement and one from queen mary university of london and each of those have um, nice resources on the Oxford one in particular has a sort of nice PDF table of, of, of a variety of, of evaluation methods just to get you thinking about different ways you could evaluate particular uh, public engagement but in many respects the question shouldn't be how do I evaluate my impact the question is well what's my impact going to be first and then how do I measure it uh, I second Mark's uh, what Mark said yeah um yeah maybe uh, i agree like you said uh, maybe start small with a couple of colleagues uh, or maybe a professor who has more experience on the topic and be realistic um hmm, uh, no, no. maybe uh another question is uh, just a second um uh, uh, the question is so uh, how important is to like be connected and join professional societies such as Bacchemic, Bacchemical Society or EOBNB for like uh, expanding your research or you can do it more individually? I mean with, with a disclaimer that I'm, I'm a member, member of, a society, of a society so in that sense I perhaps have a bias but I do, I have benefited from, from that and do see the value in joining and the extra support and resources, both in terms of grants that are available uh, and, and so on. Although a, a number of these societies have grants available to non-members, in particular my, my local society, the UK Biochemical Society, has science outreach grants um, that, that they run I think, twice a year um, that you can actually get small pots of money to, to fund out, uh, outreach activities. So... I think the societies play a really important role both in terms of providing money but also as a way of to sh share resources and share different ways of of, of doing engage engagement um so i think I, I would i would definitely encourage you on the public engagement side to join a society but more, more more widely for your career I, i've certainly benefited a lot from being part of a learning society and i can see the value to people for people joining And uh, do you want to add something, Dr. Rush? 
you can call me Julius. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I live in Norway now, and here there's like no, no. It's like you know, in German, it's it's a very hierarchical uh, or more hierarchical uh, society. Here, it's really really flat, like in the UK, I guess. Um, I don't know. I don't think that that outreach and science communication needs to like the only thing that's or like the most valuable is the time that we as researchers use. I don't think we, you know, everything can be done digitally right now. So I think even investing into getting a grant is like great. If you get a grant for five thousand dollars or euros or pounds, that's amazing. But it doesn't take that much. Like a good webinar can be good if that's the right target group. Obviously, if you want to do other target group, then you have to think about it and maybe have something that's more material and that meant then costs. But with social media and with with all this, with everything that we have our, at our fingertips, there's so much available. We don't even need to need money for it. The only thing is that we need time and conviction and, and mindset. Okay, thank you, Julius. Uh, so we touched the global sub, uh, subject, the global societies, and we will finish with uh, the last question, uh, the global question. So uh, about politics. So uh, to your mind, when science communication is connected to political issues, should that be openly disclosed? And uh, how you feel about that? I'm not sure I understand the question, really. What do you mean with openly okay. disclosed? Uh, Mark, just... do you understand it? I think I do, and I'll run with it, and you can you can push me back if I'm going the wrong direction. I mean, mm -hmm. it's interesting actually. We, we we haven't really talked about policymakers at all, but actually they're another public, in a way. They're another group with uh, something that connects them that that are, that are definitely worth engage, engaging with, and definitely are important to engage with, both in terms of uh, funding for, for science, but also in terms of actually. You know, the general societal laws and so on that, that govern and impact both how our science is done, but also how our science can be applied and used. So they're a really important group to engage with. And I think it is important to engage with policymakers. And, but in doing so, be, you know, open and honest about where the data is and what the science is, rather than, uh, I would say, extrapolating too much from your own, from, from where things are at. I don't know, does, does do you feel that answers the question or? Yeah, I am. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think I, like, just, just, just to the point what Mark just made with policymakers and, and, and politics, they're a super incredibly important part of the public because they are the ones who actually have the opportunity to shape the way how we live together and the way how we organize our society. So it's like an institutional question, really. Um, but what I learned is that when we work with them, they are bombarded very often, like stiff, specifically members of parliament, they're bombarded by lobbyists, they're bombarded by, by studies, whatever it is. So if you want to engage with them, it's super important to have your one, two, three points very clear. And it is, it, it's sometimes we can't really go deep with them until we have some kind of a uh, relationship. So I think they're actually the first step is to build maybe visibility, but then build relationship with one or two or three or four or five of them because eventually they are the ones that will call you and say, hey, I didn't get that. Or what do you think we should do? Um, and then you can elaborate. But the first thing is build a relationship and build credibility that you, they, that you are the ones that they are actually calling. And that will not happen in six months. That will happen if you stay in your jobs 20 years. So, you know, when you're 45 or 50 or whatever, and then you have someone that you build relationship with over years and they know they can trust you and you're a good scientist and you're good at heart, then, then you will be called. But that takes a long time. But as Mark said, it's super crucial to engage with policymakers. And it's not that easy, especially, for example, in, 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 in Brussels, where there's like, I don't know, 10, 15 lobbyists on one member of parliament. Yeah, I agree. Thank you very much. And uh, I think this is all the time we have for questions uh, for today, unfortunately. Thank you, Julius. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it was, I think everyone can agree with me. A very useful and very interesting uh, session, very interesting webinar and lectures. And we mentioned politics, so uh, we would like you all to invite you to our next webinar, hosted by our uh, African team, the Federation African Society in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. It will be uh, held in April. Do you see the, the picture now? 
Yep, we got okay. it. Okay. Okay. So it will be uh, held in April this year. It will be on influence in science policy, policies and how can scientific research be used in the influencing government policies and decision making. So basically, that we uh, the topic we discussed in short today. Uh, so uh, make sure to check our social media and stay tuned for this also this webinar um also um uh, hope you, everyone found this webinar interesting i would just like to remind you all that this webinar is recorded and it will be uh posted on our social media and web, web pages and that's about it. Thank you once again, Dr. Roberts and uh, Dr. Vesh, Julius, and everyone for joining us today. And have a great day. And see you all next uh, soon on our next webinar. Thank you.